Central bank digital currencies have been a hot topic among global institutions, but the push for their widespread adoption has faced significant hurdles. Now the International Monetary Fund is stepping in with a new guide aimed at policymakers and banking institutions, offering strategies to drive CBDC usage. This raises a critical question. Why is the IMF so eager to get CBDCs into the hand of users? And what does this mean for everyday people? Let's talk about this. All right, so I want to take a quick minute and share with you some recent updates on the CBDC push that's happening globally that might have fallen under the radar because a report came out this weekend highlighting how CBDCs are not getting the type of recognition and acknowledgement by the potential users, which is concerning to the banking institution. And so they're coming out now with some type of working paper or a user guide on how to encourage and incentivize all parties involved to really begin pushing the narrative for CBDCs. And so, like I've always said, it's not a matter of if, it's more so when will they actually hit the user's wallets for being spended. And so as of right now, it looks like there's an immense push by the central banks behind the scenes to make sure that they are ready for whatever they foresee coming, which will require them to have the central bank digital currencies ready to be used by the holders of their assets, which happen to be the fiat currencies. And so as always, if you guys want to see more of these little short takes, definitely make sure you leave a comment down below, hit the bell notification so you'll be notified when I do put these out here. And the most important part is leave a comment so that I know what your thoughts are about these subject matters here. And of course, these videos will not have the impact that they're meant to have unless you take time to share them with other people. So definitely hit that share button. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. And I want to welcome you directly to the community myself. So thanks for taking time to check this video out. But I want to jump right in. So as I mentioned, as of this past week, the IMF released a paper titled Central Bank Digital Currency Adoption, Inclusive Strategies for Intermediaries and Users which is a 57 page guide proposing a high level strategy for accelerating the adoption of CBDCs through what they call the ready framework or REDI strategy. So as you can see above my head here, figure one talks about stakeholder CBDC ecosystem. And then figure two here is the ready framework for CBDC adoption on page 11. And as you scroll through this index here, you see a lot of interesting things here. It says stakeholder engagement in CBDC in Peru, digital ruble fees for businesses in Russia. Number four here, issuing a consultation paper on the digital pound in the UK. Number five, deploying sand dollar ambassadors in the Bahamas, paying employment benefits with the e-rupee in India, and providing incentives to boost Jamdex adoption in Jamaica. And so right there at the very beginning of this paper here, it lists five to six different countries that are all working on the same thing, a central bank digital currency. So those are just some examples of things that they're talking about within this paper here. So clearly there's a lot of people working behind the scenes to make this type of thing a reality. And based upon all the money, the effort and the time being put in, the framework is being built out and it's probably coming a lot sooner than we all would anticipate. But to go right to the ready framework that they're referring to here, it stands for standing for regulation, education, design and incentives. And it's supposed to act as a roadmap for central banks to follow, outlining how they should create favorable conditions for CBDCs to thrive. But as with most grand proposals for large institutions, this all sounds better on paper that might turn out to be in practice. And so real quickly, what I want to do is break this down and dive a little bit deeper into it. So at its core, the ready framework revolves around four key areas. The very first one, regulation. So the IMF emphasizes that countries need to create favorable regulatory environments for CBDCs to flourish. So in other words, the rules need to be written. The, the rules need to be rewritten or at least bent in ways that make CBDCs more appealing to both financial institutions and to the public. So this could mean adjusting laws to make traditional banking and other financial alternatives less attractive clearing a path for digital currencies. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's very reminiscent of the earlier days of cryptocurrency regulation. Only this time, the push is coming directly from central authorities. And the second tier here, education. So the next pillar suggests that the government and central banks take on the role of educators, spreading awareness about how CBDCs work. And so overall, they're trying to make this a noble idea, except that one can't help but wonder how neutral this education will be, because more than likely it's going to be a lot of propaganda and a variety of marketing campaigns for why these digital currencies are the future and how they're convenient and going to be beneficial for you and I, completely ignoring the privacy and control concerns that many critics have already expressed as the primary reason why we don't want this. And so one of the biggest questions is, when was the last time I got government backed awareness campaign was truly neutral. Those type of things don't happen. The third tier, design and deployment. This one focuses primarily on designing a system that targets specific user groups while establishing a network of intermediaries to facilitate the rollout of the CBDCs. 
So they want to make this sound efficient, but this targeting raises a lot of red flags. Why target specific groups and who gets left behind? This is where questions about accessibility and inclusion come into play. With this new digital currency further widening the gap between those who have access to the banking sector and who don't. So ultimately setting up some type of tier system where those that are more than likely in good standing with the government, who perhaps might have a higher credit score, digital ID number or something like that, will be more favor toward having their services uninterrupted. And the fourth and last one is incentives. And so ultimately this ready framework pushes for the introduction of financial incentives to get people on board with CBDCs. So think subsidies on setup costs for merchants, lower transaction fees, or even tax breaks in order to get people to participate. And the most enticing one for the average retail user will probably be universal basic income if there was some type of banking event that disrupted the economy operated where governments will automatically step in after passing legislation and things like that and saying that we need to help the American people or we need to help whatever country they might be in, people, so that we can help them get back on their feet. And so we're going to issue 1,000, 1,500, or 2,000 EUSD or Liberty and Freedom coin or something that's very patriotic on the surface to get people to buy in. Because ultimately, when something comes crashing down, they're going to come in and try to save the day. And they have to sell it to the people by making it look as if this is something that is necessary or else. And if you think this doesn't happen in real life, there's nations that's using the same type of method right now as I speak. Just this summer, Thailand distributed digital money to 40 5 million citizens to boost their economy. This was the part of their digital wallet plan that was put in place from their most recent winner of the general elections in their country. It wasn't the CBDC directly, but it's a process that they're using to get ready to roll out the CBDC, however. And so back to this incentives program that they got in place. At first, it might sound like a good idea, but incentives often are short lived. And once the incentives dry up, users may find themselves locked into a system that doesn't serve them as well as they thought it did initially. And let's not forget the fact that governments rarely offer incentives without some type of strings attached. And so while this four-step approach sounds like it might be something worthwhile, the IMF also admits that there's still many unanswered questions. So there's concerns about the sustainability of these systems, their integrity, as well as the potential risk they pose to financial stability all remain unresolved as of right now. So yet, despite these uncertainties, the push for CBDCs continues with little pause to explore what could go wrong. So ultimately, it feels like we're being asked to trust that these issues will somehow just work themselves out sometime later on after they've been widespreadly after they've been adopted across the globe. And for those who haven't been following the advancements of the CBDCs, here's the Live Tracker app that shows you everything in real time. And as you can see, everything in green is in research, everything in red has already been launched, and everything in yellow is in the pilot phase right now, with the U.S. to be the last nation that actually rolls out one, just because we have the current reserve currency at this moment. But just to give you an update, it says the United States is in the pilot phase. It says over the years, the Federal Reserve has conducted multiple pilot experiments and studies Furthermore, President Joe Biden issued Executive Order 14067 to place, quote, the highest urgency on research and development efforts into the potential design and deployment options of a CBDC. And so it's this executive order to really kick things off as of March 9th, 2022. And you better believe, regardless of who's in office, Biden's signature was a go ahead to invest money, time and energy to making sure the nation has something ready when they need it. But then again, that's not it there's a broader context. So why is the IMF so invested in promoting CBDCs right now? Perhaps it's because the central banks see the writing on the wall. Cryptocurrencies and decentralized financial systems are growing, challenging the traditional banking system monopoly. So by promoting CBDCs, central banks can attempt to regain control of the financial system, offering a digital solution that's still centralized and tightly regulated by state entities. But let's not forget that just a month before this paper came out, the IMF was proposing to tax crypto mining electricity usage at a rate that would increase cost by 85%. So what does that mean? Proof of work projects such as Bitcoin, Litecoin, and all the other proof of work projects could be under severe threat because never forget the climate agenda is still in play. And even though the ESG movement has been silenced, the same entities that are in bed with the governments can easily turn on a switch and the ESG movement by Larry Fink and BlackRock could still be back in play. And so this potential threat here of 85% taxes on proof of work mining will literally shut down the mining sector in the US and eventually in other nations as well. So this is a threat that a lot of Bitcoin maxes aren't talking about right now. And like I always say, the government is not your friend. So anytime there's a threat to their rule of law over the masses, they'll squash it quickly. And it could be what they have planned after this election process and after the banking contagion unravels at the same time the CBDC is announced. So this message is clear. The IMF wants to throttle the competition while pushing their own alternatives to the world. So what does this all mean for the average person? So on the surface, it might look like this progress to some, an easier way to manage transactions, potentially lower costs, and more efficient monetary system. But beneath the shiny veneer, it's hard to shake the feeling that this is just another way that central institutions are trying to tighten their grip 
and their chokehold on the average user of their currencies. Because there's no doubt in my mind that CBDCs will become a tool for surveillance with central banks able to track every single transaction. So unlike cash, even though it has limitations, it's still something physical that you can hold in your hand to transact with in the short term, which it also offers some degree of anonymity. While digital currencies on the public blockchain leave a data trail that's hard to erase. So ultimately the IMF's new paper isn't just a set of recommendations, it's a strategic push towards a future where central banks maintain control in an increasingly digital world, all under the guise of modernization and inclusion. Whether that's something we should embrace or question is still very much up for debate. But then again, if you've been following the channel, you know where I stand. I'm not a big proponent of digital currencies as a final option, more so just as something to speculate with. Because at the end of the day, they've made it clear. You'll own nothing and be happy. What's the easiest way to own nothing other than having access to just software? But anyway, thought I would take a minute and share some thoughts. Curious to hear what you guys think. And as always, if you know where they're taking you, the goal is to resist as best you can by not relying solely on this digital world that they're trying to steer us towards and yet continue to remain in the physical, tangible world where you actually hold things that are of substance too. And that's a part of the reason why I'm excited to start the Silver Team, where I can be amongst people to understand the importance of silver and put their money where their mouth is and getting their weight up. So if you haven't and you got interest in starting your own silver business, then this could be for you. Go to mysilverteam.com, get all the information you need, sign up, and start saving in silver one ounce at a time. And then last, we got the gold notes where you can actually save in 24 karat gold notes, which I believe is the cheapest form of gold you can actually hold because the average person is not able to go out and buy a whole ounce approaching $3,000 right now. But with these fractional notes here, you can redeem some of that paper and get something physical in your hand that would definitely retain its value regardless of what happens in the world. So if you guys are interested in that, go to buygoldnotes.com or just click the link in the description, take you right to the main page there and you can get your weight up in gold as well. So anyway, just want to take a minute, share my thoughts, curious to hear what you guys think. If you found value, hit that thumbs up. As always, resources in the description, and I'll catch you guys later. Peace.